in the remote jungles of Guatemala, 7,000 feet above the clouds. You just lean back in your hooks, your belt, and just say, what a great day God's having today. Never have I thought I would climb a pole above clouds. Where progress has been light years away. I had no idea that people actually truly lived this way. <laughs> Thirty-two Hoosier linemen challenge gravity, mother nature, and terrain, offering more than hope. It's opening a door that they don't realize what it can give them. Creating more than change. It would be really nice to come back in a few years to see what it was, what it is now, and what it what it turns out to be in the future. Bringing power to the people. Power to the People is made possible through the generous support of Cooperative Finance Corporation, CoBank, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, and the NRECA International Foundation. They come from the heartland, from towns of close friends, with values of community and family held even closer. Neighbors, husbands, and fathers. Working in one of the most demanding and one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. They are the first to restore some normalcy. When sudden evil rips the normal away. Henryville, March 2nd. These people had something and it was all taken away from them. They ain't got nothing left. So it means a lot when you can come somewhere and help somebody out. The call often comes in the middle of the night. The time away from wife and kids, measured in days. The moments on the job, tallied in 16-hour increments. The working conditions, often harsh. Meals on the run, standard. This is a lineman's life, the men you never see, known often only by the work they leave behind. It takes a special type of person that's not afraid to just jump in with both feet and go at it. I mean, these guys are go-getters. You have to be able to want to go and go and go until you get people's lights back on. These men have shouldered the burden in blinding snow and bitter ice. And at disasters like Hurricane Katrina, any place there is a need. But where Gavin, Jordan, and 30 other Indiana volunteers are heading next is uncharted territory. It's one thing to restore power to people who have lost it. It is another thing to bring it to people who have never had it. For more than 50 years, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association's International Foundation has been making electric power a reality in developing countries. It's taken weeks of training and a year of planning. Some of those are 700 foot spans, guys. That's a lot of weight. And, and it goes down the valley and back up the other valley to get to the next pole. Well, you gotta- gonna get that? Organizing half a million dollars of equipment and manpower. But now, Indiana co-ops are sending the largest volunteer crew in NRECA history. They will electrify three remote villages in Guatemala in one of the toughest expeditions yet. For the families of the linemen, like that of 15-year veteran Troy Fisher, it's an emotional time. Take care of mom, have fun. I'm proud of Troy. I'm scared. It's just fear, it's the unknown. I just need to know that he's okay. Have a really good time. I love you. Love you too. Bye, guys. <laughs> Saying goodbye 
is part of the job for a lineman and for his family. I don't think everybody can do it. Uh, I think it takes a special kind of determined woman, probably as determined as her man. You know, he's determined to go and help and she's just determined to hold down the fort. Our kids just grew up realizing that at any minute dad could get a phone call and he could be out of here. Always knowing that, that at any time he could be, you know, off to help somebody else. I've learned 23 years of being married, you don't worry about them. They go out, they do their job, you pray that they'll stay safe, and you know, that's what they do. And they love it. Guatemala City, port of entry into a strange new world, made all the more curious because many of the linemen have no idea what to expect. You're talking to somebody that's never been out of the country, that's never flown before, and leaving the United States is an eye-opener. You lose that sense of security. It takes two days to get to the highlands where the linemen will begin their work. Two days of winding roads, streets strewn with vendors, and the endless parade of colorfully painted buses spewing forth both exhaust and passengers wherever they roll. Yet framing each chaotic scene is the overwhelming size and beauty of the mountains. No flat land. I was surprised that it's just mountains. I mean, mountain after mountain after mountain. I mean, right on top of each other. You're thinking, there's no way a picture can, can explain or can show. You can't not think of God when you see this. What else could do this type of artwork? The linemen begin their 7,000 foot climb to the summit. But there's only one way up, a narrow rut, punctuated by the occasional remains of a mudslide that redefines the notion you can't get there from here. This is the road we came in on, and as we leave, you'll notice it looks like we're just gonna drive right over the cliff. We were so nervous, um, all of us, that I know that we're in the truck I was in. We talked about it on the, on the way up, or, we're all standing so that we can bail off the truck. I'm not kidding, we're strategically planning to bail off the truck if it starts over the hill, you know. Tough as the ascent has been, when they finally arrive, the linemen realize their obstacles are just beginning. I knew it was gonna be rough. I didn't know it was gonna be quite this rough. Didn't realize we were gonna have to pack some stuff almost a quarter of a mile. I figured, oh, maybe five or six city blocks off the road. Not a quarter of a mile to a half mile in, in some stance. I had my backpack on full of, I had a first aid kit and uh, stuff that I had prepared. And then I also had my tools. And uh, we were walking through the coffee plants and they were hitting me in the face. And this boy was probably waist high to me. And he was walking through and they weren't brushing him. And, and the path was just wide enough for him. And I thought, gosh, if I was only his height right now, I could get through there pretty easy. I just had my hard head on and stuck it down and used it like a bulldozer, I guess, and, and trudged on through. I've been in line work 35 years and done a lot of different work. Worked hurricanes, worked ice storms, and this was probably the toughest work I've ever done. Stop. Stuck in a tree. Stuck in a tree! Climbing a pole is probably the, the most, really one of the most dangerous things a lineman can do because if you fall off, there's the potential of dying, actually. But there's even a bigger potential, probably, of, of injuring yourself bad enough to, to uh, completely change your life. There's always that unexpected that happens that you hope that nobody's in harm's way when that unexpected happens. Gavin Strance is manager of job training, safety, and loss control at Indiana Statewide Association of Rural Electric Cooperatives. The reality of the job was that we were in a remote area, a very remote area, and uh, I knew that if we had a serious accident, even though they said they'd medevac us out, it was going to be tough getting them guys down off that mountain. If it takes a little bit longer to do the thing and make sure it's the way we need to do it, Take the time to do it that way, guys. Safety is always number one with linemen. But even with that overriding mission, Gavin is mindful that during his long career, two fellow linemen have died on the job. As work begins in this primitive place, he knows the risks are higher. When we was in Guatemala, 
it wasn't the perfect world. Terry, did we only bring one drill? We can't even get it up here. They, they, they had a broken truck. The one is, yeah, right in the middle of the road. Find out, Terry, what is going on. In the States, the linemen are used to stringing 250-foot spans. Here in Guatemala, the distance is seven times that. There's a pole down in here over to the far house. I think that was like 14 or 1,500 feet. Yesterday, we strung almost 10,000 feet of wire. Hey, Chris, hey. We got her all warmed up for you. Thank you. Guy, guy, I am. No paved roads, no bucket trucks, nothing below but jungle, and a 1,000 foot drop. The tough job is just beginning to get tougher, more precarious, still full of unknowns. Get a shovel. Get a shovel. Woo -hoo. Oh. I'm pulling you back that way. <laughs> Woo! I get a shovel. Got up there again. <laughs> that pole got exciting. Uh, it was set shallow. We had a gap on this side four to five inches uh, once we got up on top and it shifted on us. So it got pretty hairy for a minute. I always pray. I, I pray about, I just did then. I pray the whole time I go up the pole. Um, maybe it's a little redundant, but nope. hey, I'm just like, it. hey, you know, keep me and him safe and don't let this thing fall. And that's just what I do, it helps me. Nothing is easy here. Everything is a struggle. Oh, oh. Tell me when, Larry, we're stuck pretty good. All the work takes longer. For us linemen, it was, it was a feeling of these guys met us for the first time as these locals, and we don't look like we know what we're doing because of the confusion. And, the, and, and that's an, to, to me, it's embarrassing. It wasn't smooth sailing. It's hard to get it choreographed to where it, it all falls in place. Get a hold of somebody and get us some transportation. Those guys, I said a truck left. They don't, Jeff doesn't have any transportation. Can you okay, call? They, they are there. They, they are with them there. And Jeff can't find them. He, Jeff's up there. He can't find them. They've walked up that road. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. We're walking today. Buddy. Yeah. I could just hear on the radio that we lost our interpreters, which is a handicap for us because it was not being able to really. A lot of them understand with the pointing. But trying to get it down to what pole specifically to go to is a problem. What do you call it? I'm starting to pick up a little Spanish. There are shortages. I'm making a piece of triplex because we don't have any. It's been challenging. We've had to improvise a lot. Come up with a way to create and do everything. When you don't have the materials, you make do. Us linemen, we're trained, and in our, in our initial response is just get out of our way. We'll build this. Well, we've had a couple of conditions here where the fog, a guy could be on one pole and he couldn't see the guy on the next pole because of the clouds. We're working in the clouds and the elevation. So we're working in conditions unlike anything we've ever encountered in any of our lives. No, this is the first time I've ever been somewhere this high to where the clouds are actually lower than the land. Something you never, you never dream or never see. We have fog back home but it feels much different when you get to walk through a cloud. It's an odd feeling when you get to breathe that air, a coolness that comes into your lungs. I like that. You didn't tell us that. I wasn't worried about you to help. I was on the pole, uh, and as, as I was working, I was getting close to finishing, and you can hear the thunder rolling in, the clouds uh, coming from behind me. And I heard a big crack of thunder, but I didn't want to, I really didn't want to turn around and see what was coming. Yeah, it, it's kind of exciting when you're on a pole and you can see the lightning flashing around and you're kind of thinking, well, that was close. But I didn't feel anything this time. Uh, that, that in there was closer and I didn't feel any, oh, I felt that one. <laughs> they fight Mother Nature, the rain. Stuck down over the hill, and it was poor. we got caught in the rain. There were three trucks below one truck, and it was stuck. Well, my concern was, we have nowhere to go. What are we going to do if we can't get this truck undone? And the terrain. We've been in the backs of the trucks and getting beat around. I've got bruises where I didn't think I'd have bruises before. <laughs> I know everybody else does too. It's just hard to get around up in here. 
I rode down and, and uh, the rails were beating my back and my sides. And then the next day I had to put my climbing belt on and, and there was spots that were sore that I didn't think that uh, should have been sore. It was, they were bruised up from that, that ride. Well, material's running short and time's running out. So there was just about every day I, I didn't feel like we were gonna complete everything we wanted to complete. That was our constant worry, and I think it was their constant worry too, is are we gonna have enough material to do the job that we looked these people right straight in the eyes and said, yeah, we can do that. We promised these people and we need to do it, and then that makes us work a little bit harder and turn it up a notch. I mean, I've been in the Marine Corps and went through their boot camp, um, you know, went on all these storms, and, but I mean, this is the first time they're like, you get no equipment. You know, you're down over the, sh you know, shovel and, and your, your own hooks. The first week seemed like we already been here two weeks. Out in the field, the frustration builds. Today's been a rough day. Everybody's uh, temperament's starting to go just a little bit because you, you could tell everybody's starting to get frustrated. We don't have anything, Martin, to work with. They take off with all their tools, sticks, and everything. No excuse, Dennis. There's no, there's no reason to pull these other ones out until you get one out. He knew that. Patience and perseverance. Honestly, I didn't have that the first three days. I was having that, wanting to dominate, dominate that, them tough times myself. Yeah, I felt horrible. Uh, I actually did lose my temper that day and, and uh, felt horrible about it. And I apologized to the ones that was, was by me that um, was humbled again. Injuries, illness. Insects, tempers fray, doubts grow. Will they finish what they started? They are linemen. Let me tell you what, you tell a lineman they can't do something, I guarantee you they're going to get the job done. Base camp in Hoya Blanca. A river runs alongside the compound that provides four to a room shelter. It's constant rush changing with the rain and the winds, providing an underscore to the sounds of early morning. They got the jelly, I got the peanut butter out. We're gonna head out, we're gonna get a good day's work. Let's be safe. Terry, you wanna leave us off a word of prayer? All right, bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we wanna thank you again for all you've done for us. We certainly appreciate you watching over and protecting us. And we hope you'll continue to be with us during our journeys. Uh, we ask that you continue to watch over our families and protect them in our absence. We ask all this in Jesus' name as we pray. Amen. 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 Go to work, guys. The linemen have only 30 days to defy the odds and accomplish the mission, to string 20 miles of wire and bring power to more than 1,000 people, men, women, and children, who've been waiting their whole lives for this, who've been promised electricity before, only to be betrayed. Just amazing how they put corn on the side of the hills I like know. that. Yeah. Just unbelievable. With each trip up the mountain, a new lesson is revealed about the people and their mystifying culture. So unlike home, so unlike anything. We were riding in the back of the truck and there were two locals that were riding in the cab and uh, they, um, they stopped all of a sudden and we couldn't figure out why. And we looked off to the side of the truck and there was this armadillo running up the bank of the hill and it didn't have a chance um, because the gentleman jumped out of the car or the truck before he could even stop and he chased it down the mountain. And we couldn't figure out why, but what we found out is that what they do is they raise those baby armadillos up to a certain size and they eat them. They are so big, the mountain people tell the interpreters upon meeting the men from Indiana. And to people living lives cut off from an outside world, an initial feeling of awkwardness is mutual. We're getting stared at like, we're, well, obviously the, the, the aliens that came in to this little village and, and nobody knows what to think. Over time, these barriers just went away. All of a sudden, you know, yeah, we're Americans, we're gringos, but they weren't afraid of us. I think the turning point was probably seeing the amount of work that the village people themselves were going to do because these Guatemalan people, I have to tell you, they are, work tremendously. Their work ethic is unbelievable. Seeing these guys set their heels in, seeing the Guatemalans set their heels in, together as a team we were forced to reckon with. Beautiful.
once they saw we were willing to come down there and help them and get the job done for them, then there was a whole different attitude change. We saw how much they wanted us down there. That one there weighs about 1,100 pounds. They're small but mighty. <laughs> I've watched them today, well, just like the transformer. They would pick that up, four guys picking up a three or 400 pounds transformer and carrying it in terrain that's hard to walk with nothing on me. And they would just me bop down the trail like it was nothing. They were gonna get that transformer there no matter what. And, and it was amazing. They knew how they wanted to rig it, and they took off. That shows right there their, their ethic, their work ethic, and uh, their determination to get something done. And it's this unexpected strength and the astounding eagerness of the Guatemalan people to work side by side with the Americans that humbles the linemen. They're amazing people. To see what these men accomplished, you seen them carrying that pole up that hill the other day. I didn't even feel like a man after watching that. The stuff that they did was brutal, with carrying the poles and digging the holes. They did the hard stuff. They could clear a path to them, machetes faster than somebody could with a, with a chainsaw. Those guys headed down that hill and the trees were just a falling and you could hear it. It was something to see. They're great. They're, if it had been for them, we wouldn't have got any, or a lot of this work done. They've been great as far as showing us shortcuts. You get all over them coffee plants and you can't find where you're going. You get, it's like a maze. But they'll, they'll point you in the right direction. You tell them we need that wire down to that pole, they jump, they do it. Seeing them bust their butts makes us want to, you know, work even harder to help them out. I mean, it's just amazing what they do and how hard they work. After being here, I think I'm going to go home with a new mindset. And they taught me if you have a will to do it, there's, there's, you're going to find a way to get it done. If you say something can't be done, they prove that it can. A quiet respect grows. We feel very happy because we know these people have come to actually work. They are hard workers and we have supported them a lot because we can see that they work hard. They are setting an example for us, how we can help other people too. We did not know how to do that before. Working side by side has brought the people of two continents together, closer than could either have anticipated. Yet for the linemen, every day also brings with it a sobering reality. How bad the living conditions are here. I don't think anybody in the States realizes that there's still people here with nothing more than a tin roof. No windows, you know, no doors. You know, I've given my lunch away several times, you know, because they need it worse than we need it. Guatemala is a country with many needs. Two thirds of its people live below extreme poverty. Almost three out of four children under the age of five are malnourished. In fact, Guatemala has the fourth highest rate of chronic malnutrition in the world. The indigenous Mayan and Quiche eke out a subsistence living here in the Cuchamatanes Mountains. They live on the corn they grow on any available sliver of land and plant coffee up and down the nearly vertical sides of the mountains to harvest some of the world's most coveted coffee beans. Their hard lives reflected in their faces. Because poverty is never far from the surface, the country hosts scores of international humanitarian efforts, like these Boston College students from Timmy Global Health or the Alfonso Eye Clinic in San Cristobal. While families work to get by, faith and love of family, community, and traditions give them strength. And somewhere 
In the growing brotherhood between all the workers, the Americans learn an unexpected lesson. The Guatemalans teach them the difference between hope and faith. And I really experienced it yesterday. I looked up on the side of the Dobie house in the village we were in. They had taken our scrap wire and wrote Jesus S. Omar on the side. He says, Jesus is love. That's what it's about. Faith. It isn't hope, it's faith. None of us will ever forget what we've done in Guatemala. And truthfully, you know, when we stop and take a look at it, God gave us that opportunity to achieve what we achieved. Although they are more than 1,100 miles from the nearest corner of the U.S., the linemen's thoughts are never far from home. Today's news, Hurricane Isaac has left the southern seaboard in ruins. I just wonder how all the linemen down there are doing. Waiting for Jeff to complete work at the top of the pole, Bobby, Todd, and Gary become reflective. The conversation drifts to the Gulf Coast, the familiar crisis call at midnight. You get done about 2, Been there, done that so many you times. get called at 2.30 or so and back up and at it. It drains you mentally. This part of it. Most people don't understand it though. You think your stomach gets upset down here on Guatemalan food. <laughs> Getting up yeah. in the middle of the night and trying to get adjusted for those, those long weeks, storm weeks. Yeah. Well, your stomach really gets twisted. Yeah. My wife and kids know that, that when it starts to storm, uh, you know, they, they give me a hug or a kiss and, and say, we'll see you when you get done. My wife and kids have suffered a lot, but they, yeah. I, I, I appreciate what they put do or put up with. That, yeah, those are the <laughs> words I was looking for. I appreciate yeah. what they put up with. Yeah. She's a good lady. I've got a good one. And it is a way of life for sure. That, that caring part, you know, you, you don't, I don't care what you pay a lineman to get out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning to battle an ice storm or, or put lines back up where a tornado is completely taking it two or three counties over. Yeah, you could have said no to all that. And not that it's, it's above all that other, that it's, it's that more important. But somebody needed you that much more at that time. This is more than a way of life that brings these men together. It is a brotherhood. We got each other's back. We watch out for each other. It's a family. It's a special family. It's not It's not blood family. I think we're all a little crazy. <laughs> Just borderline. You got to be. Who else was going to say, uh, hey, yeah, I'm going to stand on a piece of metal that's this wide and a chunk of wood, <laughs> 30, 40 feet up in the air, and be near the kind of voltages we deal with. It's certain death. I don't know whether it's because we're over adrenaline junkies or whether we're just all a bunch of nuts. <laughs> it's one of those jobs that you can't afford not to pay attention and keep concentrating on what you're doing, not for one second. You can't have the me attitude out here. I mean, it's, it's a whole group effort. That's what this was. They're a band of brothers, and they, uh, they mean a lot to each other. They really do, and they mean a lot to me. As work progresses, the Indiana linemen set poles by hand. It's me and you, pal, the old guys. We show them how tough we are. And when a new pole needs to be set, the two oldest crew members, pushing 60, Terry Atkins and Felix Vanner, dig the six-foot hole. Turtles. <laughs> but all that is just a precursor to an unimaginable task. Raising the 35-foot, half a ton pole from horizontal to vertical, using the only tools they have, manpower, cooperation, and determination. We had to set several poles by hand down there, and, and setting poles by hand is a little unique compared to using a piece of equipment. Feel them stairs vibrating, these big fat guys coming down. Not standing under it, you notice. <laughs> oh, thank God! <laughs> If there is one person whose energy never seems to wane, it is Terry Atkins. Always quick with a joke, or sometimes the good-natured brunt of saying, his good-natured enthusiasm seems boundless. Turn that camera off for just a second. <laughs> Even in the toughest of days, it's the joking back and forth 
that's kept body and soul together. His is bigger than mine. <laughs> Bobby was once a radio DJ when in school. About seven, 8,000 feet in the air. Uh, clouds are a little low, but not too bad. We can still, still have pretty good uh, view of the scenery. And the trees are looking nice. It's cool, 75 degrees. Thanks for visiting Hoosiers Power of the World, Guatemala. Way to go, Bobby. That was good. That was good. That sucked. <laughs> just try to keep the best attitude and keep the guys up and going. They might get down or something like that. You just got to try to pick them up and joke around. I mean, there's a lot of joking around that goes on at work and things like that. I mean, that's how you have fun with what we do. If you don't have fun, it's not fun. Wouldn't be worth being in this business. She is known as Abuelita, little grandmother. The lines in her face tell the story of the hard life she's led, the wood smoke damaging her lungs and eyes. Bernada Dia Lopez is 59 years old. It is very hot. I have bad eyesight. I can barely see. I am diabetic. We have to cook on this kind of stove. We can barely afford to eat. Well, it aged her at least 20 years. The smoke from cooking in that house and the breathing that in their lungs, and it is a very hard life. Her children and grandchildren have already anticipated the big moment. For when the lines and poles they've watched zigzag up and down the peaks and gorges will finally reach here and change their lives. That's good, Miner. It's going good. <laughs> Everything is about work. There's no leisure time. You either work or you don't eat. See these people work every day uh, for something like this, for just one light. I mean, it's amazing. Most thing I like about it is when you get done and the people, uh, you know, how grateful they are for us to work in the conditions we do and turn the lights on. That's what it's all about. Eight days after the linemen arrive, Abuelita's house is the first to be electrified on the mountain. This will be a moment linemen and villagers will never forget. I'm not a carpenter. I don't build churches. I don't build schools, but I can build a power line. When we lit them lights up, saw everybody's face, that, that made everything worthwhile. You hear stories from years ago when people first got lights, and you, you thought, well, these people are going to experience that. It's uh, something that'll last with me forever. It's probably the, one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. We left knowing that it's going to make it a lot easier in the future for those people. We can see now. Thank you so much for everything. God sent you here to help us. We are very happy now that we have light. In the second village, it's the story of Rosa Sanchez that becomes the favorite among the linemen. Like Abuelita, she grew up in candlelight and wood smoke. And also like Abuelita, she has waited patiently for the dream of electricity for 72 years. A lot of the people up on the mountain, you don't see them smile very much. I had her flip the switch. Uh, she turned around and she had a, a big smile on her face. We knew how grateful she was and they all hugged us. The, the whole family hugged us. And, uh, and, and that's what we came for. It was very humbling, very humbling. But now, work begins on the most daunting phase of the project. Tucked far up in the mountains, the people of village number three, Nueva Esperanza, had been told not to expect any miracles, that the Americans might not be able to reach them. It is a bitter message. Years before, they had raised money to bring power to the village. They began to raise some poles when the local contractor stopped them, saying that electrification was impossible. That did not, however, stop him from disappearing with all their money. Now the villagers line the rocky path up to Nueva Esperanza to greet the daily arrival of the linemen that tells them their long-awaited dream is at hand. How this fledgling electrification today can grow into a catalyst for real change and saving lives 
is another story that began four years ago. Dusk. In Hoya Blanca, the wet season is in full swing. But head northeast, and you enter a different world. Skies are clear. Temperatures approach 100 degrees. These are the dusty paths that wind through the nearly 200 small towns that make up Ishkan. What little infrastructure that was here was destroyed by the three and a half decades of civil war. Signs of progress are everywhere in the region, but never more than here in the miles and miles of new highway construction. Once the trip from Ishkan's capital, Playa Grande, to the city of Koban lasted seven hours. Today, with luck, you can make it in three. Before 2008, several expectant mothers from Ishkan who needed emergency surgery were sent to Koban because the clinic here could only provide nighttime critical care by generators that ran three hours a night. Some died in transit. <laughs> then linemen from Georgia restored the region's power grid, bringing life-saving electricity to Ishkan's emergency room and maternity clinic. Thank God, since the introduction of electricity, we've been able to see patients at any hour of the day. We can do a cesarean section on a pregnant woman without the risk of taking her to the operation room without electricity. There used to be more maternal death here. If someone is in danger, here anything could happen, and generally, maternal death is a bit elevated. Neonatal death, too. And now it's gone down. Thank God, through the introduction of power, projects have started moving along. And in the villages, electrification has made for better schools, and for the children, connections to a much larger world than their parents ever knew. The other teachers sometimes bring the computers to present activities to the kids. We're also happy with that, and I think that some of them are very advanced, and it could be that they will be professionals in this community. It has brought us a lot. Some around here have already tried to have their small carpentry shops, many things that require electricity. So the truth is, to describe for you the many things that will qualify as a benefit, there are many. Back in Hoya Blanca, the lineman's spirit has been willing, but the flesh has been pushed to the limit. The daily beating they've taken on the road up to the villages and the long days at the summit have taken their toll. But precious downtime brings moments to connect with the people of their temporary home who help in any way they can. Mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of recognize the blue shorts. In the humid air of Central America, blue jeans and cotton shirts won't dry. And base camp becomes a jungle of its own, with clothes waving in the endless breeze of drying fans. The symphony of whirling blades provides the underscore for moments of reflection as the linemen reach out to those they miss back home, telling tales of exotic insects and the constant battle against them. It itches a lot, but it's getting better. It's drying up and finally going away. The fleas that he slept with, he only joked about it. I don't think he ever really let it get him down. Or stories of the rigors of daily life. We were out of lights at home base for four days. I mean, we didn't have any lights here where we were staying. So no hot water, no lights. We had to fire up our generator, even have lights to see to do anything. And of course, there's the food. I think I've had enough rice for a little while. I'm probably looking for steak and potatoes. But mostly, they share thoughts of family. They've sacrificed ultimately. They're doing without so that we could be here. The first one she sent was just, I love you, Daddy. But every day I had a card pack for my wife and my little girl. And I read them every day. You know, it brings a tear to your eye, but it keeps you close to them. I tell you, so I'm going up every day. That's a six week old granddaughter, and that's why I want to go home. <laughs> See how much she's grown. Oh, she'd be a different girl. Can't wait. Yet the linemen's never lived, who's heard the slogan, all work 
and no play. Beans roasted by the linemen themselves bring daily cups of coffee. You got half a water, let me take it out. <laughs> a walk to Mexico reveals a border more notable for its lack of being a border than anything else. <laughs> That's what it's all about right there, guys. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and there are always the children. Bingo! Morning and evening, they line the bumpy road to the villages, shouting out a greeting Bingo! that always makes the linemen smile. There was a mother one day that she felt that, she, that we were being disrespected. She corrected her daughter and said, you know, you really should call them Sir Gringo, Mr. Gringo. They are everywhere, playing with toys, begging for attention. Jeremy's even taught them his famous coyote on the plains call. They like it, so you can hear them now. <laughs> They're answering me back. <laughs> oh, the kids are great. The kids love to play. At first, they're very shy, but then once you break the ice, it, it, you know, it's like you've been here all your life. Are they up? Are they up? I have a 16-month-old boy at home, and when I see those little toddlers out running around and being carried, it, it makes me think a lot of my son. To see these crusty linemen who, who when you get them back in a co-op, you know, they're, they're sometimes unapproachable because they put on this, this, this barrier out here playing ball with the kids. It's just incredible to witness this. Each morning, children walk past base camp on their way to school. Primary education up to age 12 is free in Guatemala. 60% of the indigenous families in these rural areas are illiterate. And it's hard for families to afford uniforms, books, and supplies for their children to attend school. So many may not finish. But today, they're all dressed up. Gavin is invited to explain why the gringos from Indiana are here. Nine-year-old Braley Gomez Castillo wants to tell Gavin her dream. You want to be a doctor. Good. Wonderful. Good. Well, I look at these faces and they remind me of the kids that we have back in our schools. All happy faces and full of energy. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show them where we're from. Okay. Indiana. Aquí es Indiana. Five and a half, six hours plane ride. Okay. Uh, vinimos desde aquí, seis horas y media de vuelo. The men that we brought down here climbed the poles to run electricity from the pole to their house, making it easier for them to read their books at night. <laughs> so they can get better at their school studies. A lot of this work couldn't have been done without the help of their parents. Okay. Pero mucho de este but it's after Gavin hands out the pens, coloring books, and balls to the youngest children that it hits him. I'm thinking to myself, you know what, I'm going to help these kids even have a better life than what they have right now. I may not be able to make them any happier than what they are, but I know down deep they're going to have a better life. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. And people think, well, you know, you're down there building power lines. Well, you're building more than power lines. You're redirecting people's lives. You're changing them forever. Makes my whole trip down there worth it. Morning meeting. Just a day and a half left. And the remarkable has happened. There are no agenda items. The men from Indiana have finished electrifying the third village, the village that was impossible to reach, the village where no promises were made because the task was impossible. These men have done the impossible with time left to spare. We're Lyman. I've never once 
on this trip been disheartened and thought, no, there's no way. It's just throwing the towel, it's just quit and go home. No, never once. The home of coffee grower, 73-year-old Rafael Diaz. A gathering of the hopeful, waiting for the final connection, miles away to the grid in Mexico. Word arrives, it's done, and there is light in Nueva Esperanza. For all except one. If there is one Guatemalan who has gained the respect of the linemen more than any other, it is Jorge Herrera. He has been on the job every day. His hands stained silver by the wire he has carried through the jungle. His genial attitude unflagging. Upon hearing that his lights did not come on, the linemen go to his home. It is a simple fix. The outlets were bent in shipping. And what once seemed ironic now seems like providence, for the linemen are there to share the moment when the hardest worker sees his work pay off. The miracle, all the love and hard work you have put into us, there are no words for me to thank you. It's pretty emotional because, uh, you know, he, he hasn't had electricity in 25 years. He even said, uh, you know, what was one of the first things he was going to do since he had electricity, and he said he's going to leave his lights on all night. At a very introspective evening meal. Thanks, guys. The reality of what they've accomplished overwhelms even the man who's always been quickest with a smile. Uh, I'll be honest, when we, <laughs> we showed up here three weeks ago or so, I thought there's no way, man, there's just, this, this country's going to eat us up. But you guys, you guys did it. Sorry, guys. I got to see what my grandfather did in 39. Like 73 old man today. Pulled that switch for the first time in his life. And that's why we're here. And don't let anybody take any of this away from me because they can't. Because we did what not anybody and everybody can do. And don't forget that either. You guys did one hell of a job. My hat's off to all of you. But I can't believe that we were able to get a crew like this. Everybody actually come together as a team. It was awesome to see. I'd work with any of you guys anytime. We're told to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works. And I think we've done that here, guys. We've let the light shine, literally. It's a special Happy night birthday. for another reason. Bob Palmer's birthday. Congratulations, Bob. What better place to spend it? <laughs> you guys all worked together and we all did this. You guys gave me the best birthday present ever. And that's to see these lights come on today on my birthday. How many of you would come back? How about next time we build some line along the ocean? <laughs> These wooden pallets have carried wire, transformers, and tools from the states. Today, they will carry some hope into these mountains. The day before, the linemen strung wire to a shack, barely larger than a tool shed. And in a world that has already shown them unimaginable poverty, what they found inside stunned them. No furniture, a father incapacitated by epileptic seizures, a mother blind, a little boy, and a girl, six years old, her head shaved because of lice, her toes sticking out of shoes that have been too small for too long. She does the caretaking, the cooking, the survival of her invalid parents and her little brother resting on her tiny shoulders. It was very humbling. I, I just, I'd never seen anybody live like that. I've never seen it firsthand to be that sad. You have no idea. It, it was something very um, heartbreaking. When we left that place, I cried like a baby because it was just hard to see. And my son's probably a year younger than this little girl. And I can't imagine the amount of responsibility 
on my son that this little girl has. We decided that evening we're gonna buy him a pair of shoes. Uh, and then it turned in, well, we bought her, we'll buy him some clothes too. So we bought him each an outfit and a pair of shoes. We bought the mother a pair of shoes because hers were worn out and her father a new pair of boots. Um, and then we decided to buy, you know, collect a bunch of food to give to him. And so the linemen return, bearing gifts, their handmade table filled with food and presents for the children. It is then that hope is replaced by heartbreak. The linemen learn that the family with nothing will lose even the nothing they cling to. They are being evicted. We um, took up collection between all the guys and which is a hundred dollars American and gathered that into pay that off for him. So that's one less thing they have to worry about. Yet it is not until the night before they leave Hoya Blanca that the men from Indiana learn that their generosity has inspired the entire town to help the family. The elders from the church come up and they had heard what the Americans had done and they wanted to pray for us. You could see a tear or two shed coming down the cheeks of those linemen. And linemen are pretty tough, let me tell you. They're, uh, they're a unique breed. And they, uh, you know, to see them guys shed a tear or two is, is, you know you're tugging on people's hearts when that happens. But that was the things that remind me of how rewarding this job really is. so much appreciation, the balloons, the fireworks. They gave us everything they had over, you know, to show that they appreciated what we did. Pretty neat, amazing, pretty amazing. The Guatemala! 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 And a friendly game of soccer, which the Americans won, 5-2 by the way, while suffering more bruises than at any time climbing poles. I can speak for all the men from Indiana that came here to do this project, that they will never forget you, and you'll have an everlasting memory on our hearts forever. God has written your names on a special book and has a reward for you for everything you have done for the people here. We are really happy now. When you leave, we will cry because we do not know when you will be here again. The music is quiet now. The linemen gone, but the memories are still vivid. You'll never get a view like we've had from the top of these poles on the top of these mountains. That's a view that we'll never get again. In ways no one could have predicted, the linemen who traveled 1,800 miles to bring power to these three villages find they have experienced a power even greater the power of the human spirit. Lessons that will transform the linemen, just as the power they brought the villagers has already begun to transform their lives. I've talked to a few wives since I've been back, and they called me and said, hey, what'd you do to my husband when I was down there? And I said, I didn't do anything with him. I said, I didn't do anything to him. They, they got that experience on their own. Seeing the faces the first time those lights come on, and it's like, man, it is worth it all. It is worth everything, every bug bite I've got, every sliver I've got in my hand, or, um, it is worth it all. It was more special than I ever could have ever imagined at that moment, you know, it was, for me, I, I think that to see that gratitude out of people that have so little. You see the look on their faces every time you go over the mountain, it makes you feel warm inside. Know that you're alive. Yeah, I'd come back. I'd go back next week if I could. I would go back in a heartbeat. These are people that I'll remember all my life. It was just an experience I'll never forget. I hope if I get the opportunity to come back, I would. To see their, the faces on the kids along the road, on the way up there, and at the village, 
you know that it's going to improve their way of life. As they get older, they'll have opportunities that their parents and grandparents didn't have. They keep them connected to the world so that they can grow. The people are obviously great, big-hearted people, just like in our country. It's been an adventure, but it's been an honor and a privilege to serve the people of Guatemala. By far the, the greatest thing that I've ever been a part of, by far. Imagine it now, somewhere in Hoya Blanca, or Las Nubes, or Nueva Esperanza. The women no longer have to walk miles to grind corn, or cook in smoky shacks, or work in the dark. Throughout these savage and beautiful mountains, farmers will earn more to support their families from their coffee bean harvest. They can build a clinic and more schools. Their lives will change forever because of something we take for granted. So now, when darkness falls behind these mountains, the lights come on one at a time, and their future shines more clearly because these Hoosier linemen brought power to the people. I think it changed me from the simple fact that, you know, I, I look at life today in a, little, in a little bit different eye. We're so lucky in this country. And don't get me wrong, we got the greatest country in the world. But why can't we have those people see some of that same thing? That's what we tried to do for those people down there make a better world for them. Power to the People is made possible through the generous support of Cooperative Finance Corporation, CoBank, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, and the NRECA International Foundation.